Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to The Cicada Gown Project. You will soon be seeing why I'm going to be calling it The Cicada Gown Project, but unfortunately we are not going to get to that today. Although I may have some more of that spooky b-roll featuring an actual cicada or two because in a very strange turn of events I actually ended up ordering some bugs off the internet, which for someone who is actually quite afraid of insects uh, has got to be the strangest purchase possibly I've ever made, honestly. But we're actually not here to talk about Cicada yet today, because before we can get into the embellishments and stuff way down the line, I have to actually, you know, fit my pattern and figure out what I'm actually doing and how to make Victorian things, because again, it's quite new to me. I've never made a full Victorian costume before. I've never made a Victorian bodice of any kind until that last video. And like I mentioned, the single layer of this truly Victorian tailed bodice pattern this one here, in a single layer of qu quilting cotton fit me quite well, but I knew that a single layer of like rather malleable quilting cotton and then like two, three layers, uh, you know, fashion fabric, interlining, lining, whatever was going on with the actual instructions for the pattern to make a finished bodice was going to fit differently. Um, a single layer of quilting cotton is going to be much more like malleable and flexible and easier to like submit to my curves as opposed to a finished version all lined and boned and things like that. That I knew was going to take up some more space and I didn't know how much space if I needed to go up a size, what I needed to do. So I knew before I jumped into any pretty fabric, any silk, anything like that, I needed to just make a full mock-up following this pattern exactly. So that is what I did this last week and now I will jump in and show you how that went. Okay, first of all, let's look at the Truly Victorian pattern illustration itself. So you can see here this tailed bodice or tail bodice from 1883. Presumably they took a resource from 1883 to draft this bodice. All of the truly Victorian patterns I believe are draft using, drafted using like extant resources and that's how they came up with these patterns. But this one has different neckline options and also you can choose between the long tails in the back or shorter tails. So I have cut mine out with the short tails. You can see a dress here. This one's from 1880. That's um, from the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and is a fabulous color that has a sort of tail back bodice situation similarly to this. So the bodice continues down the back into these little tails here. This one, the tails are separate, like there's like a left and a right tail. Um, so it's a little bit different, but same some sort of idea. Over here we can see some later examples of little tailed bodices. So on the very right here we have one from 1884 with the long tails in the back. The center dress here has this fabulous jackety kind of version of it. Oh, it's so cute. It's closest to the pattern, honestly, this one in the middle here at 1886, oddly enough. And then there's one from 1885 with these dagged edges and a shorter tail as well. And I really love that, particularly that teal dress there. Ooh, so cute. Try not to think about how much I want to make that one. I also was looking at some different references for how to put together bodices like this, um, in addition to reading the actual instructions that came with the pattern. This is Hecklinger's Ladies' Garments, How to Cut and Make Up Ladies' Garments, um, a booklet or book rather, from 1886. And this is uh, from the Library of Congress, I think. It's been scanned by some library and then uploaded onto archive.com or archive.org or whatever it is. I will have it linked below so you can browse through this book as well. But this was uh, illustrative of how they, these bodices were expected to be constructed during the time. Although they mentioned like using soap on your thread and things like that. So who knows really what they were actually up to, honestly. But you can see here a good illustration of what the bodices looked like on the inside. The truly Victorian pattern itself does suggest fully bag lining this bodice. Um, but as you can see here, the period ones were not done that way. Usually they were left open inside with the seams exposed. Usually they were felled down or at least whip stitched around the raw edges or at the very least pinked. Some of them you can even see have silk or some sort of binding around like a bias binding around each of the seam allowances, which we're not going to be doing that, but that is very involved. And if you were doing a very couture version of this, if you're making a worth gown, perhaps you would bind your edges, but I would rather pink or just simply whip stitch them shut. But you can see here, there's a fashion fabric, there's an interlining, but there is no full lining. Although the tails on the bodice, the little back center back tail area does seem to be lined. Um, so that's kind of the only area and it seems to be lined with the fashion fabric. So, you know, taking some notes from here and then you can see here also there is boning along all of these seams and the two front darts, which the truly Victorian patterns uh, instructions do suggest. And I did end up doing for this bodice. So we'll get to that later. Again, here is my little music note single layer quilting cotton mock-up from last time that I used to cut down to make that corset cover pattern. But I, you know, I was very loosely following the instructions to make this, but now it's time to follow them quite exactingly and to use interlining and all that jazz. Although I will still be just using some cotton muslin that I have here in my stash. It's kind of a, almost a stiffer or heavier weight muslin that I had laying here. And I was just going to use this for both the like quote unquote fashion fabric and also as the interlining and then also as the lining as suggested by truly Victorian to have a full lining. 
Um, but I ended up just using this as the fashion fabric, the outside basically. And then I found some more of that uh, kind of toile print quilting cotton I had left around from that last muslin and used that as the interlining, funny enough. I wanted the outside of this to just be plain muslin so I could really get a good look at what it looked like without a print distracting me. And also if this worked out, uh, like if this fit perfectly, I wanted to use it as a base to be able to draw different style lines on and make decisions about future bodices with. So I wanted something plain, and so I went with just plain cotton muslin. I get this um, in five yard bundles from Mood Fabrics, so I will link that below as well. All right, so now that I had all my pieces cut out, I cut, um, they, you can see these big sections at the bottom. Those are the tails um, on the back sections, the center back and side back, um, and those you don't interline. So you can see the interlining I have cut the pattern piece above those large sections. But here what I'm doing actually is the only part of this that I'm sewing together and like lining properly is the center fronts. So I'm pinning the center fronts right sides together here and then I will turn those uh, like out um, so that this front side is finished is what I'm trying to say. Um, so the rest of this just gets it's supposed to be basted around the edges, but of course I wasn't going to hand baste this muslin to mock up. So I ended up just surging the raw edges of all the rest of this, but you're just flat lining everything basically, um, including the sleeves even. So here I'm just lining up the inner lining pieces. As you can see, they're shorter here than those extensions for the tails. You don't need to interline the tails. It would become very thick and stiff if you did that. But up here at the top, you do put inner lining in there. Again, my inner lining is printed. I know that's weird, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and instead of basting these by hand, Again, because that's nonsense for a muslin, I am just going to serge the edges to hold these pieces together and to flatline. On the silk version of this, I will do hand basting on that. Um, but I'm again, we have to save my hand working mojo for that, honestly. But these big rectangles at the bottom of these back pieces are what get folded into the pleats on the back of this. And there's a little pleating pattern included with the truly Victorian pattern, obviously in their instructions that show you how to pleat the back. It's basically just double box pleated. And then I have my sleeves here too. There are two parts sleeves, so it's like an under sleeve and an over basically, but we'll see that again later. Here I am just surging again, that interlining down to flat line all my pieces over here on the serger, just trying to keep everything aligned as I go around. I don't think I'll be using the serger at all on the actual bodices for this. Uh, this again, it's just a muslin, it's a mock-up, so I don't mind using this method, but I think for the real one, because this is kind of like my dream gown and the culmination of, I don't know, a lot of things, I do want to do more handwork on the actual gown itself. Again, underwear isn't seen, so I don't care. Um, and mock-ups, of course, are not meant to be seen, except for by you. Um, so I also don't care about surging on these, but for the real deal, I'm gonna hand do it, I know. All right, so over here on the machine, I can go ahead and sew those center fronts together like I was talking about. I'm sewing them right sides together, the lining and the interlining, or not the lining, the fashion fabric and the interlining, excuse me, so sorry. Um, just sewing that with half inch seam allowance as usual, but I am, however, using the tiny stitch length on this machine again, that more kind of Victorian stitch length, something like 20 stitches per inch. So it just looks really nice and clean and small. And I figure, you know, it's the best mimicry I can do of a very tiny, precise hand stitching. Um, I don't know how small they made their hand stitches back in the day, but I assume, you know, they, a lot of the Victorian manuals I've been reading, they keep talking about like, skip three threads. So like in the weave of the fabric, they expect you to make your stitches always three threads long and stuff like that. And it, that's just precision on a whole nother level. Um, but as close as I can get to that without wanting to tear my eyes out, out is to use the machine and use a small stitch length over here. Um, of course, a lot of this kind of thing, just dressmaking, Victorian dressmaking in general, after the like late 1860s would have been done by machine. So it's fairly accurate to sew this on this cast iron machine. Again, my machine is electrified and is from 1955, but the basic mechanisms of this machine are very similar to earlier machines. So it's not that far distant in, in general here from the methods that would have been used to construct a bodice like this back in the 1880s. All right, I'm just clipping that seam a tiny bit because it is curved, and you know me, I love to clip a curve. And then I can turn that right side out. I also, um, you'll notice here the flat lining I did, I put the print on the inside. I was using the back side of the quilting cotton because again, it had the print in a less like contrasty way. I really, I would have used another solid if I had one around, but I didn't have anything solid in stock other than more muslin, and I wanted there to be some difference so I could just tell if I needed to be able to tell the difference between the inner lining and the, and the uh, outside, I guess. 
I keep calling it the lining, fashion fabric and interlining. I'm not used to there being an interlining, honestly. You know, I hardly ever actually properly line my garments, let alone interline them. That's on another level for me. I'm far too lazy for that normally. All right, now that I have that center front opening seam there along the center of the bodice finished, I can go ahead and then um, baste, quote unquote, the rest of this. And by that, I mean, run it through the serger as well to flatline the rest of this piece, but that front center front edge, because hypothetically there would be buttonholes and buttons or hooks and eyes along that. You just want it to be a nice finished edge. Here I am sewing the lining together, the lining that Truly Victorian suggests. So this is like a princess cut here in the back. So you have this convex and concave curve meeting. I always like to pin these with the convex curve underneath and the concave curve on the top. I think I have that right. I could have that flipped. The geometry folks in the audience can let me know in the comments below. Um, but basically the one that curves out, I like to keep underneath and then I pin the straighter piece on top of that. And in this muslin, it's got enough give in it that you can pin this kind of curve seams together, no problem. Um, sometimes if you're working with a really tightly woven fabric, you need to put clips in the seam before you even sew it because it doesn't want to go together. But in this single layer of muslin, it was no problem. I am just using my normal banged up sewing pins for this also, because again, it's just the muslin of this. I will use only ultra fine silk pins and stuff like that when I'm doing the real deal. But again, here in muslin, I can be a little rougher even though if I'm, I am trying to be precise when it comes to like matching up my seams and matching up notches and getting the fit on this quite correct. That way I can see if it will fit, honestly. That's the whole point of making this whole mock-up is to see if this garment will fit. So I am trying to be quite precise about matching up every, all my seams properly, but I am not being as careful, you know, with muslin, it's not gonna snag or anything, nothing weird is gonna happen to it if I'm a little bit rougher with it. So I'll just go ahead and sew that lining together. The back tail pieces are shaped a little bit funny, but you also do sew the side seams of like the extension of the tail together. Um, you'll see that a little bit later in some of the other times when I'm pinning it together. Here, I forgot to kind of film that part of it. And yes, I do love playing with my colored lights. So we have a green light here next to the machine for most of this. You know, we gotta have that ambiance in general. I'm sewing the bottom of the tail. See, I'm just sewing the side seams, the straight side seams of the extension for the tailed portion of this bodice. Then I needed to transfer my darts onto my now flat lined, well lined and, and also flat lined front pieces. So again, I've just put that chalk paper, that tracing paper between the pattern and the muslin itself. And went ahead and traced on my slightly strange darts here, these very long, long front darts for these Victorian things. So just went ahead and transferred those on here in that pink chalk using this paper. I've had this paper in my stash for so long and I can use it so many times and I just have never had to buy more. So I don't even know if it's still available. Hopefully it's a thing that's still around. I'm sure you can find it online for sure, but I'm not sure if sewing shops still carry it. I hope so. I haven't been shopping in a you know fabric store in person in a very long time at this point. Um, but now that my darts are marked, I just put some pins to hold the fabric, the two layers of fabric together so they wouldn't move around while I did this. And then here I am just pinning the darts as I would any other time I've pinned darts, even if these darts are a little bit strangely shaped compared to my mid-century things, they still get done the same way. And I'll just set those next to the machine and then I can sew them into place. Can't say I've sewn darts with two layers of fabric like this, perhaps ever before. So, you know, it did make me a little bit nervous. My chalk didn't transfer perfectly here. So here I am just drawing in the ends of my darts here because they didn't, paper wasn't perfectly placed, but alas, it will be fine. Okay, so over here on the machine, I can go ahead and sew those darts. Again, trying to use a smaller stitch length, just again to have that Victorian feel to it. I don't know, that may be something I'm just making up, but it, it, it's giving the feel for me, so, you know, whatever. Um, and I, of course, whenever I'm using these thicker, 
like normal standard sewing pins. I am removing them. I'm not sewing over these ones. Um, I'm trying with this, well, new to me, but vintage machine to only ever sew over ultra fine pins. If you're new to my channel, hi, welcome. I do sew over pins. I know I'm a naughty girl. Um, but ever since I switched over to having, working on this 99K, I haven't been as much because I am quite enamored with the machine where in a committed relationship now, and so I don't want to hurt it by sewing over pins, so I try to only sew over the most ultra-fine of pins, so I wouldn't sew over these thick, thick boys here. Um, so I am removing them as I go, and then I'm just going to sew off the edge of the tip here, the end, for this start, and then I will tie that off, just tie the ends, tie knot with the threads here at the end, as I normally do for my darts, I normally just tie the ends. I am just using Coates and Clark's polyester thread for this, by the way, um, or like dual duty, all purpose kind of thread. I have a lot of this still in my stash. I have been switching over to Guterman thread mostly, um, not because I stopped liking Coats and Cards polyester thread, but just because I stopped shopping at Joann's and now I mostly shop online where on Mood Fabrics it's Guterman that's available and so that's what I've been switching over to. I do try and make sure I have the same thread on my bobbin, like I don't have Coats and Clark on the spool and then Guterman in the bobbin. I want to make sure that the thread in, on the bobbin and on the spool is the same. Um, that way I don't get any weird tension problems from the threads being different. It's not, it's kind of rare that that would happen, but just to avoid all potential issues, I keep my threads the same. Um, but I am just using a random color of thread here, just using up stuff I have in my stash. For some reason I have a ton of dark red thread. Don't know why. Apparently every time I ever made anything dark red, I, th I thought to myself, oh, I need to buy more thread when I really didn't. So I'm just using up some of that to make this mock-up. It's also nice to be able to see my seams and see my stitching against this muslin so I can see where any problem areas may be. Okay, so now that my darts are sewn, I brought this over to the ironing board and I thought to myself, should I cut up these darts and like iron them flat or do I just leave them like this? And in Victorian sewing, did they iron them towards the center front like I normally would or towards the side? All these questions I had going on. For some reason I, you know, the uh, truly Victorian patterning instructions didn't give me any instruction on this. Um, they said to bone over the darts, but they didn't say what exactly like how to finish them. So I went online, I hopped back on over to my computer and referenced, you know, all those resources I had been looking at earlier to see what seemed to be done mostly. And I found extant examples of bodices where the darts were just pressed down um, like this, but pressed into place and then boning done over that, or where the dart is pressed down and that is used as a boning channel. Um, but most of the time it seems that they were sliced open like I'm doing here now and then pressed flat and then boning was sewn in a casing over this entirely. So that is what I'm going to do for my mock-up here today and what I will do for my bodices moving forward. It seemed to be the most common method of finishing these is to cut these open, press them open. A lot of times you'll see on bodice patterns actually the dart is like cut out of the pattern itself. So this is sewn together like a seam as opposed to sewn as a dart, but that seems more fiddly to me. So I'd rather almost sew it like a dart like this and then cut them open afterwards. Um, that just seems a lot easier than having to have these long thin slits up into the actual piece of fabric itself. I'm not dealing with that. So <laughs> I'd rather just sew the darts and cut them open like this. Up here at the top, I did kind of have to decide which way the darts would lay. So I just pressed the little tiny tips towards the center front. Usually darts in life are pressed towards the center. Um, I don't know, you know, about anything pre-1930, <laughs> but usually when I'm sewing things, I press darts towards the center. So that's what I went with with this. And they seem to be okay here on the other side. Of course, I will have to be more careful when I am pressing silk later on. It is nice to be able to use as much steam and heat as I want on this muslin because I'm not worried about, you know, iron sheen or anything like that on this mock-up or on muslin in general. And also the smell of hot steamed muslin is a very nice smell. For those of you who are seamstresses who have ever worked in a workroom where muslin's being pressed, it's a nice smell, isn't it? I wonder if there's any such thing as a candle that actually smells properly like muslin. I don't know how you would capture that scent, but somebody's probably at least tried. And here I am pinning that same curved back seam, that like princess seam along the back in the fashion fabric. Of course it's interlined, um, but then I will sew those together as well. The back kind of like comes down and extends past the waist. You can see I just turned a little bit. I left the needle down and turned the project a little bit. That's because the waist, uh, the dart, not the darts, the pleats don't start at the back waist. They start below it. So it's a little bit fitted past the waist, this garment, um, which is not something that I'm used to making. Usually I make things that end at the waist because I have everything end at the natural waist and then sew a skirt on, but this comes down a little bit further from the skirt. So again, something I'm not exactly used to. I will again sew the little ends of the tails here. This is again the side seam of the bottom tail extension part. So those need to be, need to be sewn together as well. Just do that while I'm over here. 
like so. All right, so now I can go ahead and sew the side back here, which I'm patting, and you can see I clipped that seam before I pressed it open in there. Um, you can see that the seams were clipped, the curved seams were clipped on these things, and I'm just transferring that um, notch over. I can't, couldn't remember the word notch. Notch over onto this side back again, just so I can make sure I line up this side front properly. It's kind of a side side. The front covers the entire front up to the side seam, and then there's these two side pieces. You have this side piece here, and then the side back. Four pieces on each side for an eight piece around the middle total, as opposed to just fronts and backs, which is what I'm used to, as I've said before. So I'm just pinning those sides on, and I'll take that over to the machine and go ahead and sew those. You'll notice I haven't sewn the center backs together yet. The center back of this isn't one piece, it is actually two, a left and a right. So I'm working on the left and the right separately at this point, um, just because that's what Truly Victorian had suggested, and so I was just following their instructions um, mostly, for the most part. I was The only time I was making an adjustment was to make something more historically accurate, um, or like leaning towards historical accuracy a little bit more. So I can just sew those sides on like so. So yes, that's right, you did hear me correctly earlier. I said that I bought a few cicada. I know. I'm must be going mad. My that remember when I mentioned Bug Boy in one of my lookbooks? I'll put a card up to that lookbook here. It was supposed to be like a kind of museum intern slash journalist uh, themed story lookbook, and I mentioned that she went on a date with Bug Boy, the entomologist. And uh, I'm becoming Bug Boy because I've now bought two cicada that I didn't have to pin them myself. They already came like spread or like uh, mounted, I suppose. And then I put them into a shadow box so I can use them for, I don't know, B-roll eventually here. And then I actually did today buy a butterfly online that I will have to pin myself. So new hobby alert. Apparently I'm going to become an entomologist. Don't know what that's about. It's especially because again, like I've said, I'm afraid of bugs. Butterflies are fine, usually. Caterpillars, more scared of caterpillars than I am of butterflies. Don't know what that's about. As soon as like the body of a butterfly gets too big and juicy, that's a big no. So like the cicadas are really on the edge of something I'm afraid of, honestly, the real ones. Ooh, the big, have you, if you've ever seen the big, big cicadas, those things are, if you've ever seen like the, there's so many different uh, breeds or species of cicada. And if you've ever seen the, like the big boys, they are, they look like they're made by Fisher Price. They're huge and they just look like a toy, but like the world's grossest toy, you know, they're gigantic. It's very disturbing, but in general, cicadas are very fascinating, and their life cycle is very fascinating. And weirdly enough, we'll tie into this whole project in the end, but I'll get into that some other time. But as fascinating as they are, they are also quite gross. Most bugs are gross when you look up close to them, honestly. But, you know, slightly creepy crawly. That is the Halloween vibe we're going for here. I don't know where I got this notion to... I guess because, you know, I made those shadow boxes for my, when I was redoing my sewing room down here with those fake paper butterflies because real frame butterflies are so expensive, but then I figured out you can frame butterflies yourself, and that is a lot cheaper. So, what a terrifying, terrible discovery that I have made. Here I'm just pressing my seams open again. I've just been sewing all my side seams together this whole time. Right here I'm pressing the seam between the side and the fronts, finally. So I have sewn the fronts onto this whole adventure, but it is still in two pieces, a left and a right of the bodice at this point. They haven't had me sew the center back yet, seam yet, so but I'm just sewing all my side seams. It's not that exciting. Might as well talk about bugs, which I guess is kind of gross. I do apologize. But at this point, they did finally tell me to sew my center back together. So here I'm laying one of my pieces out. Again, you can see the unwieldy tail bits of this. They kind of just get in the way and are a little bit annoying. And it ends up very thick, especially in this kind of heavier weight muslin. I'm not exactly sure what I want to do about the tails, if I'm honest. You'll see what they look like in the end here. And you can give me your opinion on them. But I'll just pin my center back here and then I can go ahead and sew that shut as well. And we'll finally have a kind of working vest-like bodice here. And you do sew a little bit past the end here, just a little bit, a half inch down it says to sew. So I was following that idea. Getting that finagled under the dang presser foot over here. Again, this, these tails are a little unwieldy, especially at this point where they're not, they're not all sewn together and stuff. Bit annoying. But again, just back stitching here at the start, and I'll go ahead and sew this center back seam. Thank you all for the many suggestions of excellent names for the owl down here, by the way, our new owl friend, the TV lamp. Um, several amazing suggestions that may end up being names for cicada that are hanging on my walls now, but I think someone suggested I should name the owl itself McConnell, 
after the fact that I bought it because Christine McConnell has one, and now I feel like it's only fair, because I directly copied her by buying this lamp, that the lamp itself is called McConnell. So now he's, he sounds like a professor anyway, doesn't he? The owl's name is McConnell. I don't know why, but it's a male. I don't know. But uh, yeah, the, the owl's name is McConnell. So whoever suggested that, you, you win the non-existent prize of the day, and the, the owl has a name finally. But we will have a great many other creepy crawlies around that we can name Archibald and Baldrick and all the other excellent suggestions that you all left for me. Perhaps I'll get some more owl lamps. That that exact ceramic lamp, by the way, does come in other colors, so if I ever see another one, I will be tempted. Now that I've finally sewn all my seams together, I can go ahead and bone everything, by the way. That's what I'm sitting here doing. This is some strange boning that I ordered from Mood. It's like plastic riglin, 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 whatever that kind of like cheap boning is called. But it said it was like in a casing, I think. But I didn't read very closely. I just said, oh yeah, I need some of that and put it in my cart. But it's not in a casing. It's just like formed this way and then dipped in like soft, fluffy, velvety flocking material almost. I'm not exactly sure how this was made, but it's like fuzzy like velvet. However, it is not in a, like a fabric casing, which is what it's supposed to I'm supposed to be using for this nonsense, but for a mock-up, it will work. And so I'm just cutting these to size over the seams. These back ones, they su suggest using spring steel, which I do have some spring steel boning sitting around, but I think I'll save it for like the real versions. And I just didn't bother to um, bone these curved back seams at all, but I did bone the center back as well with this strange, weird plastic stuff. And I just kind of pinned those loosely in place. And then I came over here and sat down and for a good hour and a half here, or maybe more, I didn't really time it, just, you know, kind of loosely stitch these pieces of boning down to the seam allowance along the inside. This is how it was done, although obviously with much smaller and more regimented stitches. Here I'm just getting that boning on there because I might, I'm at this point I'm thinking that I might still need to use this boning and I might have to take it out later to use in one of the real bodices, but I actually ended up ordering some proper faux whalebone um, boning from Burnley and Towbridge. I will link that below as well. It's mostly used for making stays, but it will work for this project as well. I will have to make my own fabric casings for it, so that is something you will be seeing in the future. But here I am just hand stitching this boning down. You are supposed to bone nearly all the way up to the end of the dart here. Um, not completely to the tip, but um, to like an inch out, I think is like what the recommend recommendation was. And then for the bone down the center back, I only went like halfway up because it seemed that that was how it was done. So here's what the inside of the bodice looks like now with all that boning sewn into place. So now we are truly getting somewhere. It has a shape. It's going to become even more unwieldy to use. When I, once I was working with it, like at this point, I was like, man, how is this silk going to withstand all this nonsense? But ugh. here I am just about to sew the collar together. Of course, it's like a little Mandarin, like short collar, but I did this wrong. Um, I mean, the sewing of it right now, this is fine, but I attached it to the bodice incorrectly in that I didn't leave a gap in the front for the where like the bodice would overlap if it were buttoning closed. For some reason I was like, ooh, this needs to stretch to fit the very top edge of this bodice. And it's like, of course it doesn't because it just needs to meet at the front, not overlap like the rest of the bodice does. So there was one of my mistakes on this one. Don't know what I was thinking there. I do apologize if you ever hear strange buzzing and such in the background of my videos. I just am not in charge of the weird sounds that the house makes. Um, you know, all the utility room for, I, I'm recording in a basement. I, that's where my studio is and the utility room is nearby and makes strange noises sometimes. So sometimes the audio is clear and sometimes the audio is affected. At least, you know, it's the middle of the night so no one's out there mowing the lawns. So we have that on our side. I did use a knitting needle to help with the corners and the curve of this collar here. And I clipped my curves inside of here too so it would lay nice before I attached it to my bodice incorrectly. You know, <laughs> I didn't think I was doing it incorrectly at the time. I hope you have all been having a good October. I know it is a wild, wild time still here in 2020, but at least October is like, again, like I've said, the best month, is it not? Um, spooky season. Everything is pumpkin scented and or flavored and all the Halloween vibes are out and about. You can be as goth as you want and people can't really question you. It's excellent. So here I am sewing that collar on. I've stretched it right to the edge, as you can see. What am I thinking? And like this raw edge on the inside would be covered if you fully baglined this like Truly Victorian suggests. But because I'm not truly uh, like fully baglining it, I didn't exactly know. 
I'm not exactly sure how I want to finish this. I suppose I could add like a band of bias to cover this area inside, but I'm going to have to do a little bit more research when it comes to how this exact seam allowance area was finished on the inside of these things. Because if they weren't fully bag lining it, how does this get covered? I don't know. I'll have to look into it. I haven't done enough research on that particular spot yet. Figured I should wait until after I see how much fitting I have to do up here by the collar before I even figure out how to, you know, finish it nicely. No point finishing it nicely if it doesn't fit, honestly. All right, now I'm beginning my sleeves here. These are just two layers of muslin here because I had run out of my quilting cotton at this point, but I'm just not uh, matching up the notches here and sewing both a left and right sleeve. And this is the two layers of muslin and it's quite stiff. So these came out like quite stiff. I mean, there's like sizing in this muslin. I didn't pre-wash it because I was never going to like wash and wear this. I wasn't worried about it getting dirty, um, but it's just quite stiff and like almost feels like having cotton canvas sleeves, like having like denim sleeves or something. So I'm not sure, you know, looking at the fit of these later, are they going to look nicer in something in a lighter weight? Probably, honestly. Um, so because these came out so awkward, I'm not really like papery almost. I'm not really sure I can rely on this as a good mock-up to see how the sleeves fit, but you'll see what they look like later. I think I need to adjust where the elbow lands on these, but again, I'll show you that when you see it on my body later. Yes, this doesn't turn it into disaster any time point. Spoiler alert, <laughs> at this point in the process, nothing had gone disastrously wrong. I will get to try this on and you will get to see what it looks like. So just sewing the different side seams of the sleeves here. Of course, there's two seams, kind of like a front side seam and a back side seam, and they do get lined up. Um, I actually made this little faux arm to stick in here real quickly because I don't have all the proper pressing tools. I have a tailor's ham, as you can see in the back on there, but I don't have any of the, like, I don't have a clapper or anything to stick inside something like this. So I just went ahead and made one real fast. And instead of stuffing, I, I have some polyfill around here somewhere and I don't even know where it is. It like got put away when I cleaned my sewing room and now I can't find it naturally. So I actually filled this with yarn because I once bought yarn thinking I would learn to knit, but it turns out while I did learn to do basic knit and purl and stuff, I, I can't knit, really. It's just not one of my strong suits. So I actually ended up stuffing this arm with balls of yarn. And it worked quite well, you know? Perfect amount of give in these. You can see the rough hand stitches on that thing. I just whipped it together real quick so I could iron these seams. Or at least have a better shot at ironing them. They are still quite curved, so it's not the easiest thing to press open. And then it was time, the dreaded time, to start setting in these sleeves. But first I had to put a line of gathering stitching across the top of the sleeve cap here. There were indications on the pattern for where to do this from, like where to start and where to end this. I did end up putting two lines of gathering stitching, of course, just long basting stitches. You know how I like to do two lines of gathering stitching for doing gathers. It makes them sit more evenly. It's really much nicer. So try and always use two lines of gathering stitching, even if you're doing it by hand, I think it would help. So I'm just gathering that top of the sleeve down. And so it will fit properly as the instructions say. You can see I have instructions sitting here because I was like, wait, what? What do you want me to do? I didn't even realize until I got to the step that this had a gathered sleeve cap. Like, I'm, I thought it had like a little bit of gathering to fit it in there. I didn't realize it had like gathering gathering at the top, like a puff sleeve. I mean, it doesn't turn out like a puff sleeve, but I just thought, wait a minute, isn't is this supposed to be smooth? What was the actual, what was done in the period? So I had to look up and see, were there mid 1880s sleeves that had gathering up here? Because I just, I felt like I'd never seen that before, but there were several. <laughs> I thought it was more of an 1890s thing, but it clearly, it happened earlier in the eras as well. So something I had to stop and double check. That was something I was doing while I was doing this, by the way, was kind of stopping whenever I had a question and doing some research and coming back to it. So that was part of the reason this took me a while to put together as well. But here I will just sew my sleeves into the arm size, making sure there are definitely a left and a right sleeve. So making sure I was putting them on correctly. Got it right first try, not to brag, <laughs> but they're just so curved that I feel like, I don't know how I I mean, you can always sew things in ups. I, I've definitely sewn a sleeve in upside down before. That's definitely happened to me. I mean, it's been years, so like knock on wood, but like it's happened to me. So don't don't feel like I'm, I've got any magic skills. It's just years of, I guess I've already been through it, you know, and now sewing is kinder to me. Here I am pinning my little two piece lining to the back here. I was thinking, I don't want to fully bag line this, but maybe I'll just line the back and side back so that I can line the tails. So that's what I'm thinking about doing here. I've already kind of sewn the lining, these two lining pieces I've sewn in along the bottom edge of the tails to finish those. And I thought I would finish the inside with just these two pieces because they have you bag line the whole thing. And I was like, well, I don't want to bag line the whole thing. I did pleat that according to the pattern on there. Not super precisely, let's be honest. 
but I thought I would finish the rest of this edge with some bias tape, because that seemed to be what was done in a lot of the extant bodices. They were finished with a bias edging, or even like piping and then bias down here along the bottom of the bodice. So I figured where there were not tails, I would go ahead and finish this with bias. It's just going to pin this to the outside edge and sew along that and then turn everything onto the inside. I'm sorry I didn't capture more of me doing the tails themselves. Again, there will be plenty of opportunity for this nonsense when I'm making the real deal later on, when all this will be repeated just in a prettier fabric, and hopefully with even better results, honestly. But this is my, my learning bodice, you know? Learning about fit, learning about how these things go together, learning about how they should and should not go together, really. And look at that mess behind me here. Oh my. You can tell I'm in the middle of a project now, because cleanliness has, or organization has gone by the wayside. What a shame. All right, just gonna sew that bias tape on here. Again, anytime I need to like turn a corner or anything, I just leave the needle down in the project, pick up my presser foot, move the project around, put the presser foot back down. Um, no need to come off all the way. Just, you know, again, leave the needle down in the project, turn, put the presser foot back down, ready to keep going. Now I decided at this point, which was late in the evening, let's be honest, that I would rather try this on before I did like, you know, 20 buttonholes down the front of this thing and sewed on 20 buttons. Um, I'd rather try it on and see if it even fit and was worth putting the buttonholes in this because that was a lot of work for a muslin and a lot of work to be doing in something that would never again see the light of day beyond this video. So so I did not put buttons and buttonholes down the front of this particular mock-up. I did just pin it shut for fitting because that was a lot of work to do for, you know, practically no reason. So, all right, so I'm just turning that bias up inside here and I can tuck the end of it into where that, you know, quote unquote lining is back here. Um, which is nice and gave me a nice little finished edge. I didn't know if I wanted to have it all the way up or if I wanted to turn that top edge under. I think I'll turn the top edge under. A lot of the extant bodices, it seems like it's like a raw edge down here, but why why do that when I can do this? So I'm just going to almost hem this the way I normally hem a lot of my skirts here on the channel with bias. But it was a period technique to have a bias edging along the end of a bodice like this, so I felt free to do so. And this was actually my last sort of step for this. Here I am pinning it in place, but I didn't even bother to sew it because again, I was like, at this point, I'm not doing any more work on this thing until I find out if it even fits. Um, so I just pinned this all along the inside on each side here and figured we were far enough along to try this baby on. But the real question is, how did it fit? What does it look like? Could I even get it on? Well, I have it on here. And this is the finished mock-up bodice, woohoo, with my black petticoat, of course, and some 1940s heels, naturally. I need to get some proper Victorian shoes. Here's what it looks like from the side. Those are my tails there. Um, the tail on this kind of like ends at the end of my bustle. I'm not sure if I like it here. I don't know if it's too long or too short, honestly. I kind of think I'm going to make these shorter. Um, a lot of bodices have much shorter tails than this. This is kind of like a stylistic choice to have them this long but I think I might make them shorter or make that like dip triangle on the side larger. I don't know exactly how I want to manipulate these tails, but I don't exactly like them as they are. So let me know, longer or shorter, what is your vote? But here's what they look like. You can see here on the arm, how the elbow of the sleeve almost seems to be lower than my actual elbow. Like my elbow seems higher, so I might have to change that as well. Um, but that's what the flare in the back looks like. It's sticking out quite awkwardly because this, again, muslin is quite stiff. Here's how the back fits. It's okay. It's not perfect, um, but it's serviceable, I suppose. Um, I may need to make a few changes here. It's not too bad though, and it looks quite good from like the three-quarter angle here. And you can see how that sleeve goes in there. The top of the sleeve looks okay-ish. Again, if it was on the less stiff fabric, I think it would work. My hair here, obviously not very accurate with my <laughs> quarter of my head shaved back there. Whatever. What are you gonna do? But the main fit issues here, I think, are up at the top of the back of the collar and like the side shoulder seam area of the collar, there's some like bulging nonsense going on from whatever the shape of my back is, which is, I don't know, a little bit hunched and curved from years of slouching and laptop use, etc. Um, and then also the center front does not exactly meet with enough room to do buttonholes. So it's a good thing I didn't bother doing them because they wouldn't, it wouldn't have closed and I would have just felt very sad. So I need to either add a little bit into the side or add a little bit down the very center front, somehow make this just a tiny bit bigger. I really need only like a quarter to three quarters of an inch more so I can put buttonholes and buttons down the front of this, but it fits quite well. It looks like it fits well here in the front, but that's just because I've pulled it shut, honestly. 
So those were the results of my first ever experimentation with actual, you know, Victorian cuirass bodice style dressmaking. Uh, I've never made anything like that before. I think it went pretty okay for having never done it before, but those pleats definitely are like a strange situation there in the back and finishing everything on the inside. I'm used to kind of bag lining things, but it's just not how it was really done often. Um, you'll find examples of it, but it's just not actually very common to do it that way. It's, it's more common to have those seams exposed in there. Um, so just doing all this stuff that I'd never done before, I knew I wanted to practice and I want to practice again, indeed, before I jump into the silk. I will have to make another mock-up for the day bodice proper because the top of the shoulders and the way the neck fits isn't perfect. So I'm going to have to finesse that and fix it and figure out how to. So because I have some fixes to do on the day bodice, also, it doesn't, I mean, it closes very, mm, it, it barely closes down the front, not enough to put buttonholes and buttons in this. So I'm trying to decide if I should add some width to the sides or add just a little tiny bit of width that I need down the center front. So I have some decisions to make when it comes to the day bodice of this, to using this bodice pattern as it is, which is more of a, you know, covered up, long sleeved, high necked day bodice situation. So it's kind of out of the question of getting that done in time for Halloween, which I had a couple of ideas to get this costume all done by Halloween. Don't know what I was thinking there, but instead I'm going to go ahead and take this pattern. I think this is my tentative plan as of right now. I'm going to go ahead and take this pattern, cut it down into, well, take a tracing of it and cut it down into an evening bodice version. I'm going to keep sleeves on this. It's more of a, um, a dinner or reception gown, which were, you know, different than a ball gown or an opera gown. They had a lot of different gowns and you changed a lot if you were wealthy back then. So I'm going to be making more of a dinner or reception dress. Uh, I think you could still count as a ball gown bodice as well, just with sleeves for my next part into this project. I'm going to go ahead and cut the neck lower and then cut a little bit of a V in the back, change it into a bit more of an evening bodice style. And that is what I'm going to try and get done in time for Halloween, that and the skirts. So I'm switching over to doing the evening part of this first instead of the day bodice part of it first. And then we'll just continue doing the day bodice stuff once we get into November. But for now, switching over to very spoopy Halloween goth vampy evening gown situation, because then I don't have to worry about fitting the collar and we're not finagling with that until next month. Okay. We're just, it's too much to do in too little time. I hope you all enjoyed today's video, even if it was more of a muslins and mock-ups and kind of mundane situation. It's all the, you know, behind the scenes stuff that has to go, has to go on before you can do the fancy silk things. I'm not going to, risk mess messing up the silk. As I've said before, it's, I'm, I'm very afraid to cut into that. You know, I have never been able to afford silk like this before. And so therefore it is a bit intimidating. I really want to get a handle on what I'm doing before I jump in. So thank you for coming on this journey with me. Hopefully next week, I'll have something a little bit prettier to show you. So I will see you all then. Bye.